given what a record year this was and given the uncertainties that are now brewing in between the Omicron variant and between the higher interest rates ahead, what is the number one question you're fielding among CEOs? Uh, thank you for having me. And nice to see you, Sonali. I wish we were there in person. I think the number one question from CEOs right now is getting their handle around inflation. Obviously, the recent numbers at close to 7% were highly, highly unusual, given the history of 2% plus or minus, and even on occasion, 3%. So inflation is a big issue. Supply chain remains a question mark as it resolves itself, although the outlook for that is reasonably good. And then last but not least, obviously, the pressures in the labor market where you've had a permanent readjustment in terms of pricing of labor and labor demand remains very, very strong and supply is getting better. But obviously, there's a large number of vacancies here that need to be filled in order to get the economic expansion underway. Leon, good morning. It's Guy. How is that story changing their behavior? How are they thinking differently about 2022 versus 2021 as we see that inflation narrative continue into next year? I think as they look at the inflation narrative, they are trying to understand what they can do in terms of passing costs on, if possible, or on the other hand, cutting costs. On the other side of the equation, I think the supply chain issue has changed quite profoundly over the last year and a half. And we have moved from just in time to safety and security and location of supply chains closer to where the factories need them and where end demand is. So you're getting an alignment of supply chain you're getting inflation pressure that people are pushing forward, in some cases onto customers, in some cases from profits. And the net result of it, though, is I think people have managed their way through this pretty carefully. And the outlook, I think, right now is pretty good in terms of the environment for economic growth and for continued expansion. You know, I'm wondering about the regional differences here. Are there bigger challenges in Europe and Asia than you see here in the United States? Well, the European M&A market has actually been robust. As you know, the whole M&A market is at 5.3 trillion. I think those are the latest numbers. And you've got numbers in various sectors like technology and industrial that are up close to 50% in some cases and in 100% in the case of tech especially. So as we look forward here right now, the marketplace is looking through the virus, if we could say that, and obviously our thoughts and prayers go to anyone afflicted with it at this point in time. But I think as opposed to the novel coronavirus that we were all faced with last March, I think now they are working their way through it and looking at this as something that we will deal with from an ongoing basis. So we see clients and customers being very, very focused on looking forward in a marketplace that has been incredibly robust in terms of returns but probably doesn't offer that same level of explosive returns going on to 22 and 23. Leon, is M&A, though, a solution to the supply chain problem? Is M&A a solution to some of the challenges these companies are facing right now? Is scale something that they need to obtain? Uh, I'm just wondering what the drivers are next year. If this is the number one kind of problem that they're facing at the moment, to what extent can M&A resolve that? To bringing companies together, to finding new business lines, is that the way forward here? And if so, is that going to keep the M&A story intact? I think the M&A story will remain reasonably intact. But when you look at issues like supply chain, those are being dealt with by companies inside of their business itself, realigning production, ensuring safety and continuity, as we talked about. The M&A story remains completely a strategic story in terms of people adding on. And I think the one critical component is there is not a single industry that is not focused in terms of technology M&A. So whether it's industrials, energy, clean tech, fintech, obviously, the financial institution business, everyone is focused on M&A in the technology sector in order to ensure that they transform their business. So I think from a boardroom standpoint, that is a number one focus as they think forward strategically. You know, it's interesting because the markets have been so free in terms of money flowing in the past year. And you look at these high growth companies like Rivian, where there's been a lot of patience, but the cost of financing just simply has to go up as we look forward to these rate hikes. How might that start to impact some of these moonshot companies and the patience that investors have with them? 
Well, that's a great question, Shanali. If you look at last year, I think there were 400 unicorns created in the United States and partially globally last year. So the amount of private capital that is going into high growth companies continues to accelerate, especially with late stage venture funds. The IPO market, it was a record year, obviously, for both IPOs and SPACs. I think they each uh, originated close to 150 billion. So the market is providing plenty of capital. When people look at the rate outlook, you know, those of us that have been around a while, we look at rates potentially going up somewhat, but nevertheless, from a historic standpoint, rates are still at a very, very low point in time. So there's plenty of capital sitting out there in the debt markets as we look forward. The equity yep. market remain robust. Do you, do you think we're going to continue to see such huge demand for debt? Um, City putting out an interesting note talking about the fact that the, the penalty of being at the bottom end of IG versus being the top end of IG is tiny. So why not take on more debt? Why not gear up? Is that something that we're going to see significantly more of next year? I think probably not, because most of the companies that had financings to do over the last 20 months, starting out with res rescue financings, as we know, early on, and then moving towards M&A financings and general corporate financings, a lot of that has already occurred here right now. So companies are not going to simply add on debt because it's cheap. They have to have a clear use of proceeds and they have to have a clear use inside of their business or from an M&A standpoint. So I don't see people simply taking advantage of the marketplace to add on debt. It has to have a strategic purpose inside the business or inorganically. Leon, I'm curious, with the variant spreading the way it is, has that really stifled the ability for you and your bankers to get on a plane and go see clients again? That's a great question. I mean, we have been going out and seeing clients. I travel almost every single week. I mean, clients are careful. We are careful in terms of all the various procedures in place. But I think also people understood very carefully how to do transactions from a virtual standpoint. And if we have an interim period of time here where the variant is spreading very quickly, it's obviously the holiday period of time, people continue to conduct their business and do it in a virtual format until we get through this next wave. So I don't see it really impacting anything because people got very, very comfortable with the Zoom format and very comfortable dealing with each other virtually. That, I think, is not high on our list of problems.